Students, welcome again to another of our video lectures in the Humanities 232 class. As usual, I'm your instructor, Dr. Barry Graham. This material will involve Chapter 14, the Renaissance in the North. Of course, by the North, we mean Northern Europe. Once again, from the textbook, Culture and Values, 8th edition. Sorry for that short delay. The Northern Europe in the 16th century involves a synthesis of new ideas from Italy. By synthesis, we mean a coming together of those ideas. There are alternatives to traditional religious doctrine, enthusiasm for classical antiquity, and finally, emphasis on individualism, which of course has always been an important emphasis when we're talking about the Renaissance. In terms of culture and politics, the, the big players are Francis I, the Habsburgs, and the Tudors. Very interesting series on the Tudors, by the way, on Netflix right now, if you'd like to check that out. The other thing we'll want to mention is the scientific and religious revolutionary movements of this time not just in the scientific realm with Copernicus and Galileo and all of the new discoveries and technological advancements, but of course the Protestant Reformation that's going on uh, that we'll be talking about even more later. I want to show a few illustrations here in terms of the visual art. This is the salt cellar of Francis I. It was designed by Cellini. The male represents the sea, the woman represents the land, uh, the arms of the sea run into the land, and the salt bowl is in the back. And so there's an obvious sexual reference here as well, uh, even though that's not something that they wanted to necessarily draw a lot of attention to. This is a bust of Emperor Charles V by Leone. Notice that the German is portrayed as a Roman emperor. There's an eagle there at the base, uh, which, of course, the eagle represented the Roman Empire, uh, supposed to be a symbol of Rome, and ironically, in America, uh, in the United States, we've also taken the eagle as a symbol. But emperors, rulers, always want themselves portrayed in a very flattering light, and doing that as a Roman emperor is, of course, something that would accomplish that. Here's an overall map. You'll notice uh, that we'll be making comments about the religious divisions in Europe uh, circa about 1600 uh, A.C.E. here. And the medieval church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, is very corrupt. It's ripe for falling. For falling, rather, uh, we have nationalism, this fierce patriotism that people are developing for their own countries as opposed to a larger empire. It's long overdue. The outcries actually began centuries ago in terms of the corruption of the Catholic Church. There's a corrupt clergy. There's monetary excesses of the church where they're spending money on these huge uh, cathedrals. And they're basically getting this off the backs of people that can't really afford it. This is one of the things that paves the way for the Protestant Reformation. The major player there is, of course, Martin Luther. And at this time, Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door. Theses is just the plural for thesis, like you're writing a thesis statement paper. This funny-looking little short monk marched up to the church door one day with his hammer and nail in hand and a list of 95 things that he disagreed with the Catholic Church about. And he was basically saying, look, I'll debate these, discuss these anytime, any place, because I have some severe disagreements. The biggest disagreement was with the Catholic Church practice at that time of the selling of indulgences. In, indulgences were thought to be 
things that would forgive a person for their sins. And it was thought that the Catholic Church owned that right to uh, forgive the person of their sins. And so there were actually, some corrupt priests were actually charging people money for that, preying on their emotional attachment to family members who had passed away. So basically saying, you know, hey, old Aunt Betsy that died all those years ago, she's either in purgatory, um, maybe even in a worse place at this point. If you want to get her out, give us enough money and we'll manage to get her out of there. Uh, Tischendorf uh, was the one who did this uh, for the most part. And that really made Martin Luther very, very upset. And so Martin Luther, I'm sorry, I said Tischendorf, I meant Tetzel. Um, Luther's reforms involved things uh, that also resulted in the birth of the Anabaptist uh, in the Peasant War of that we mentioned here of 1525. It was a widespread popular revolt in some of the German-speaking areas of Central Europe. It, it failed because basically the Catholic Church and the aristocracy crushed it. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 peasants that were brutally killed during this revolt because they weren't nearly as well armed as the arist- uh, as the armies of the aristocracy uh, of the nations and even those uh, soldiers that were a part of the Catholic Church at this time, and it was one of the one of the, the biggest tragedies of history. The Anabaptist, and this is where we get the word for the modern Baptist Church here. Anna means again. The Baptists started this practice of baptism, baptizing responsible adults rather than baptizing babies, uh, infants. And so this was actually a term of derision. They were making fun of them as if to say, oh, look, here come those people who baptize again. And the name just stuck, and that's why Baptist to this day, it was just shortened to, from Anabaptist to Baptist, and that's why that's around even to this day. Besides the Anabaptists, there were the Swiss Protestant movements that were started by people like John Calvin. Um, churches like the Presbyterian Church today are the result of John Calvin. And then the Anglicans, which is uh, an English form of the Catholic Church, only their Protestants, but they retain many of the practices of the Catholic Church. And this results in the dissolution of the Catholic Christendom. In other words, rather than the Catholics being the only game in town, we now begin to see other churches begin to spring up as a result of these abuses and people revolting against it. Here's a painting of the funny-looking monk that I talked about earlier, uh, Martin Luther. After he broke away from the Catholic Church, he did get married and have children. This depicts Luther about the time he married Catherine von Bora, who herself was a former nun. And so you have two people who were previously forbidden to be married. They got married and had six children. We also want to look at the causes of the Protestant Reformation, there were more than one. There was uh, economic and nationalistic self-interest because of the unfair political and economic demands of the Catholic Pope. And then there was the maturation of Reformation ideals, which had really been coming for a long time, a desire for a more personal religion, uh, a priesthood of all believers, interior piety, which means, piety just means a very um, somber, very, for lack of a better word, a very religious way of conducting one's life and uh, personal devotion to God. There was also a movement in the moral and intellectual depravity of the clergy, a, a revolt against such things, and there was much of this at this time. Um, they had great wealth because, again, of these selling selling of indulgences and even collecting taxes from these very poor people. And this tended to really obviously make them upset and mad. And this, these, these movements were inspired by trying to correct some of these abuses. Here's 
a couple of columns of the differences between Renaissance humanism and the Reformation. Now, we haven't mentioned humanism yet. This is different from what we might call humanism or secular humanism today. Uh, the original humanist movement was actually started by Christians, and they really imbibed the Renaissance spirit in terms of going back and discovering all the old Greco-Roman texts and things of this nature. And so there was some similarities between the two, but it's important to remember that they were not the same. Similarities, they both had uh, a certain religious aversion to what had been going on previously in the Catholic Church. They favored the early Christian writers over the later uh, medieval scholastics. And they were both very interested in going back and mastering the original biblical languages, which in the case of the Old Testament would be Hebrew, and in the case of the New Testament would be Greek, specifically the Koine Greek. Now, there were some differences. In the differences category over here, uh, they differed over, over the idea of the nature of humanity. Um, humanists would tend to believe human beings are basically born good. Reformers, people are born depraved. Uh, there's a fallen human nature as that, re, uh, that occurred as a result of Adam and Eve's original sin. And so this idea of education came into play with the humanists because they said what people just basically need, since they're basically good, they just need a chance for education. Whereas the reformers would say what people need is a special move of God's grace to change their heart. All the education in the world will not change a fallen heart. They also differed in the idea of universal truth found through exploration of religious texts versus, in the Latin here, the scriptura sola, or it's sometimes called the sola scriptura. The reformers thought that our primary uh, rule of authority will always be the Bible, whereas the humanists said, well, but there are other texts out there too, and all truth is God's truth, and so we should be looking at them as well. Whereas the Reformers would always hold the Bible up as the primary rule of authority. Again, talking about Renaissance humanism and the Reformation and the influences on each other, there was this emphasis on reading the Scriptures, and this help lay a foundation for the idea of educating the masses, or lay education in some cases. Uh, the idea, as I mentioned earlier, about the universal priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. And so if we're going to encourage everybody to study the Bible, then we have to encourage literacy. We need to teach everybody to read. We take this uh, for granted today. But in previous times, such as this, very, very few people, perhaps as few as 3% or less, actually knew how to read. And then, humanism as an intellectual instrument. Now, the reformers would say that humanism was too optimistic and too ecumenical. Ecumenical meaning it's just taking part in too many things. And so humanism as an op, uh, was an optimistic philosophy that saw, once again, man as rational, sent, sentient, basically good, the ability to decide for himself, where the reformers would always stress that everybody needs a special touch for God, from God to deal with this problem of original sin uh, that corrupts our basic nature. The cultural significance of the Reformation is wide-reaching. We mentioned the spread of literacy. We're going to teach people how to read because we want them to study the Bible, as well as the humanists would say, as, as well as some other texts. And so there's this great diffusion of literature that's going on here. Of course, we've mentioned the invention of the printing tr the printing press that's, that's coming along later, and this is going to make access to books much more possible. Uh, there's a prolifer proliferation, uh, a spread of the vernacular text. By vernacular, once, once again, we just mean the common language of the day. And a focus on the word. By that, we mean the word as opposed to a oral culture versus a visual culture. Up to this point in history, 
things were always passed along orally so that oral, which is a different word, just means that it can be heard. They're going to focus on the need for it to need to be read. Also, people need to learn songs. And so as music is beginning to be written down and eventually published with the printing press, again, people need to know how to read that. And so in the beginning, there's an emphasis on just very simplistic decoration because we want to emphasize the word, not all the decoration around it. And this even emphasized secular art, art that was being produced outside the church as well as that inside the church. Now we've mentioned the hymns. Here's an example of a a very early hymn book. You'll notice that there's a system of notes and staffs very similar to today. There's one, two, three, four, five lines, just like we have on a modern day bass clef or treble clef. Again, the notes look a little different. The notation is still gradually developing, even though it goes back as far as 1100 uh, ACE or AD. And this is a German hymn book. Uh, Martin Luther basically restored congregational singing before it was done by more professional choirs and things like that. And uh, this is a copy of A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a hymn that's still sung in many churches uh, even today. And it was printed in the German language so that the common person could read it rather than printing it in Latin. And so this is a very important step in getting more congregational participation in the church service. Again, with these intellectual developments, we see important individuals such as Michael Montan. He was one of the first essayists uh, in history here, especially here in Northern Europe. And he's protesting against violence and religious bigotry. (coughs) I beg your pardon for that cough. And Montan wrote a very interesting work called On Cannibals or of cannibals, some of the editions read. Do yourself a favor and look that up in the book and even uh, Google it. It's a fascinating essay where he tries to make the case that uh, cannibals, and they were beginning to discover these ancient, uh, these, these more primitive cultures, not ancient cultures, more primitive cultures, as they're exploring South America here at this point in history, they do discover these tribes that actually eat their deceased loved ones. And of course, this seems atrocious and horrible to each one of us, but he actually tries to make the case that in some ways cannibals are more honest than civilized people, because at least you know where they're coming from. Again, uh, feel free to examine that. These new Renaissance scientists have a huge impact on their culture and even coming down into today when we talk about the our modern knowledge of solar systems and planets and uh, orbits of planets and these these kinds of things. And so they rejected the older traditional methods like uh, the Ptolemaic uh, view of the universe and all the practices and assumptions that go with that. I've mentioned uh, Galileo, Copernicus, and obviously there are many others. In the visual arts in Northern Europe, we have people like Albrecht Dürer, he um, was influenced by the Italian humanists and the idea of linear perspective. Linear perspective means we actually begin to depict things as they would appear as we see them. In other words, objects in the background appear smaller than objects closer up. So that idea of perspective is very revolutionary in art history. The perception of the artist is what is important. And so they start doing self-portraits, and we'll take a look at that here in just a few minutes. Uh, The classical ideas of beauty and proportion are developed uh, even further in, in terms of what we've seen earlier in history, and the artist sees themselves as on a quest for knowledge. In other words, the same scientific precision that's driving the scientist, the modern scientist of that day, is seen to also drive the artist. We also see this in Dürer's woodcuts and his engravings. These are fascinating. Do yourself a favor again, look at those in the textbook uh, on Google Images. 
lot of work goes into those, as well as the paintings that he and others do. And there's a great uh, influence from Venice. The uh, Venetian influences are also very strong. Here's the self-portrait that we talked about. Many students comment that uh, he seems like he's trying to make himself look like Jesus. Well, he may very well have been trying to do that. Uh, but this is probably his hairstyle, his beard, mustache, all of that sort of thing. And there may have been a conscious effort to doing that. In the upper left, there's a signature up here with the date of the painting. So again, he wants to make sure that the individual artist is recognized. In the upper right here, uh, uh, in his own language, it says, Thus I, Albrecht Dürer, from Nuremberg, painted myself with indelible colors at the age of 28 years old. So he was 28 here. And again, his, in some ways, his hairstyle looks strangely modern, doesn't it? Um, although the artist has depicted himself, as we mentioned, uh, in, in a Christ-like pose, uh, he's not trying to do anything blasphemous here. It was just simply an acknowledgement that God has made Christ and man in his own image. So it's actually a tip of the hat to God here. Artistic talent, therefore, ultimately derives from God. So he's actually trying to be very respectful of Christian belief here. Continuing on with visual arts in Europe, we see individuals like uh, Matthias Grunewald. He rejected most of the Renaissance innovations, tried to take everything in a different direction, uh, he did depict traditional religious themes, but he just did it in a different way. And so we see that in stuff like, uh, in, in material rather, like his altarpiece here of the crucifixion that we'll look at here in a moment. And so we see a certain amount of political and religious sympathies. Actually, after all, they are the ones paying for his stuff. This is how he, he makes a living. And the images tend to be very tortured. He's bringing out the emotion in these. And he's rejected this use of linear perspective. He's gone back to the old way of depicting things in order to make a particular point and to evoke a certain mood in the paintings. Look at it here in the crucifixion of Jesus. This is remarkable, but notice how much bigger Jesus is here than the figures that surround him. This is not the way it would appear in real life, but you do see a gruesomeness. This is not an antiseptic picture like the way you've seen some of the previous depictions of Jesus on the cross. Here we see all of the horror, the beatings, the the bleeding, uh, the people in agony here, like his mother, his like his mother over here with John and Mary Magdalene here, and it's it's just a, a, a horrific scene. Uh, no ideal beauty here, the, a real Renaissance realism reflecting the agony and gore. Um, you see it here in, in John the Baptist on the right-hand side here as well. Uh, even though obviously John the Baptist wouldn't be alive here, this is taking artistic license. And so John seems to be saying, he must increase, but I must decrease, similar to what the Apostle Paul would write later on. Continuing, another artist uh, in Albrecht, uh, Altafor, he presented things with a personal worldview through landscape. And so we see that in the Danube landscape. Uh, there's no human figures at all. He just wants to emphasize nature. And so there's this real contemplation on, be on the beauties of 